everyone. This is CS50's own David Malin and Colton Ogden. So this is a new approach for us. We, of course, have uh, lectures once a week here in Cambridge, and of course, we've done a number of live streams over the past few years. But we thought we'd, we thought we'd try something new with our Twitch channel here. Uh, Colton is a big fan of Twitch. He's quite the gamer himself and the programmer of games. And we thought we'd use this as a more interactive time to actually chat with some folks in the Twitch chat room and actually walk through some code in real time, live coding, uh, to get into the more depth on some of the things that we might otherwise talk about in class and then ultimately take people's questions and steer the conversation in any direction folks out there would like to go. Yeah, so very flexible format. Everybody who's in, feel free definitely to chime in via chat. Uh, if you aren't following the CS50 TV account, uh, I believe there's a 10 minute waiting period, so definitely follow us so you can talk to us. Um, but I see we do have one person, uh, Srini Vasank says hello. So hello, Srini Vasank, nice to see you here. Hello, nice to meet you as well. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll, we can take a, a little transition here to your laptop where we have uh, your code there. Magic. So. Yep, so we're actually sitting here in Cambridge, Massachusetts on Harvard's campus with a magical green screen behind us. And so we're superimposing ourselves, the two humans, which is why you see this nice glow I wish for I both a, of us today. I wish I had a shot of just the green screen. All I have is this. Oh, we so <laughs> that's green, but you see it is gray, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. um, and this allows us to superimpose ourselves over the code like you've seen in some other channels so that we can actually talk in greater proximity. Do it for lecture, for so the example. code itself. We do. We do this in Sanders Theater, but the green screen's way behind, and we use some camera magic to actually capture it uh, across the, the room as well. Yeah. All right, any more hellos to tend to? Uh, not just yet, no. Just a shreeny plus song. We have 10 viewers currently active, so. All right, wonderful. Well, so glad to have you here in class. It's like a CS50 section here on campus. What we thought we'd do today is um, our first trial of this is take a closer look at one of the topics we look at in CS50. Those of you who've been following along for some time and are pretty much through half of the course or so might have implemented your own spell checker at some point and for those unfamiliar roughly halfway during CS50 semester here on campus and online we challenge students to build their own spell checker which is a piece of software that looks over all the words you've typed out in a file and tells you often with red underlines which words you've misspelled that aren't in a dictionary and that's where the CS comes in that dictionary is just a really big list of words hopefully alphabetical uh, alphabetically sorted and it's a non-trivial problem to actually look up every one of the words in your file against every word in the dictionary. If you recall from our discussion of asymptotic notation, that's like an n squared problem if n is the number of words in each, just to uh, simplify a bit. Um, and that can actually take quite a bit of CPU cycles and memory. And so one of the challenges in CS50 is do that efficiently. Minimize your use of memory, minimize your use of CPU time, so to speak, and just write the fastest spell checker possible. Now, what language, of course, do we tend to write this in, though? Uh, well, we start in C, yeah. generally, for the course, yeah. And that's great, because C is super low level, it's super fast, it really takes advantage of the hardware, but what are some of the prices you'd say you pay by writing stuff in C? Programmer time being the number, <laughs> number one. Uh, you know, obviously looking for memory leaks and, mm -hmm. you know, seg faults and all those sorts of things that trip up a lot of programmers. Yeah, those of you who've programmed in C, maybe C++, have dealt with pointers, memory addresses, segmentation faults, buffer overflow exploits and the like. Uh, all of that comes into play. And so why don't we start there? Why don't we actually take a look at what it is you have had to do or if you're following along with CS50 uh, for the first time, might have to do if you tackle this particular problem down the road. And then let's actually do it in a much more friendly environment of Python, but consider what prices we actually pay for doing that. Indeed. So we have up here behind us uh, dictionary.h. This is the so-called header file that we give to CS50 students. And in this header file, do we define four functions? Do you want to summarize what functions they have to implement? Oh, actually offhand, I don't, I don't remember. I have to look at the source code. Oh, that's that. cool. We <laughs> have it right here if you'd like. Okay. Well, we clearly prepped here. Oh, uh, yeah. It looks like uh, check. Yeah, check is one of them, isn't it? <laughs> Load, uh, size, and unload. What you put yeah, now fortunately the file's <laughs> completely commented, so we can kind of uh, follow along here. So these four functions characterize, if you will, the API for spell checker. API is just application programming interface. And while this might sometimes mean some web-based service or third party you're using, it can also refer to local software that you yourself are writing or that someone else has started writing and you now need to finish. And indeed, the challenge for this problem is to uh, flesh out that API and write the actual implementation thereof. All right, so in order of operation, not alphabetically, load is the first function that students on in this class have to write. This is a function that takes as input in C it looks like const char star dictionary. And how should folks think about what that means? Um, well, const meaning that it can't be mutated. So whatever okay. data that they pass into this function should be 
not tampered with by the function. Okay. Um, a char star is just a sequence of chars or a pointer to a char, which mm -hmm. can be you know any number of chars after that. Um, but it's a, it's a string, effectively. Yep, I agree. Yep. Text data, that's going to become their dictionary. And then the name of this parameter, of course, is just dictionary. And so the idea is that this is the name or the path to the file containing all of those words that I mentioned earlier that represent the actual dictionary. And load's purpose in life, per the comment atop it, is to load dictionary into memory, and it's supposed to return a bool. True if successful, else false. For those unfamiliar, uh, we are using standard bool.h, which is a header file that you can uh, in, uh, include in C that actually gives you access to two definitions of true and false as one and zero respectively, effectively. So after load is called, once implemented, then it's the function called check that's supposed to get it called again and again and again for every word in the file you're actually spell checking. So it's that one that's got to be especially performant, super fast, super minimal memory usage, hopefully, if you're really trying to optimize those two things. Um, what does it appear that this takes uh, as input too, if you want to tackle the that one. load function? Or sorry, uh, the check. check function. So it looks like the same thing. So uh, char star, meaning a pointer to a char. Um, so a variable length string mm -hmm. or a sequence of uh, chars. Um, and then word. So it's basically going to be any size word. And we're going to basically check per the, uh, per the uh, sort of string header representing the uh, signature whether mm -hmm. the word is actually in the dictionary. So we need to check our dictionary for this word and see whether it's actually inside that dictionary, that data structure. Good. Yeah, and so strictly speaking, you don't have to use const in either of these definitions. This is just a nice mechanism for really protecting yourself from yourself, lest you accidentally uh, try changing word or try changing dictionary. The fact that you defensively, or whoever wrote this file, defensively put const there means you just won't accidentally screw up, change the value, and introduce some bug that could be very easily avoidable by making it read-only as const effectively does. So lastly, there's two other functions in this file. Uh, per the comments, those are size and unload. Unload is meant to do the opposite of load. So whatever work we end up doing in load is supposed to be undone, freed up in unload. And then size is supposed to just return the number of words in the dictionary. Now maybe that's a linear operation. You just iterate over whatever your data structure is, counting up every one of the words and return that value. Or if you're smart about it, you could probably just keep like an int or a long around and just as you're loading words, keep track of how many words there are and then just spit out in constant time that, that same value. So in C, this is a pain in the neck to actually implement this thing. You can implement it as a big array, uh, a linked list to give you some dynamism and growth. Uh, you can implement it as a hash table, which is often implemented as an array with multiple linked lists. Or you can implement it using a try and even fancier data structure that just consumes lots of memory, but theoretically is constant time in its operation, at least asymptotically. So we're not going to do that, though, in C. Uh, indeed, that's one of the challenges in CS50 itself. And one of the great moments in a course like this is when you actually change context and you switch from C, a very low level language, to something like Python, which is higher level, so to speak, that has lots more abstractions, lots more features, lots more capabilities built into the language itself. You can whittle down a 10, 20, 30, 40 hour project into truly just minutes, if not seconds, once you're actually super learned in the language. Shall we dive into some actual live code? Oh, sure. Before we do, Srini Vasank has a question for yeah. you. Uh, so pass by value can be used here instead of const. Um, short answer, no. Um, you are already technically passing in the dictionary by its value, but the catch is that the value you're passing in is its address. And insofar as passing in an address allows you to dereference that address and go to that low address in memory means that it's potentially vulnerable to being changed. And so we're declaring const here for the very reason that we're technically passing by reference here or by value, but that value is an address. And so this is why we have this defense mechanism in place. If we were instead passing in a specific char or an int or a float or any other primitive type that doesn't involve memory addresses, then yes, pass by value avoids this because the worst you can do is change a copy of the, parent, of the argument. But in this case, by definition, we are passing in a string, which is indeed a char star or address of a character or a sequence of characters. So we can't, it's not as easily said as passing by value. Right. The values here are what's what are risky. I guess the equivalent would be maybe like duplicating the data structure in the function, but then mm -hmm. that would be like horribly inefficient for something massive, yeah. like a big dictionary file. Yeah, you could totally copy the whole dictionary, but even then you'd have this window of a few lines of code where you could still screw up and accidentally change things just yeah. by nature of making a mistake. Yeah, that's true. Really good question. 
So keep the questions coming if you have any as we move ahead. But let me go ahead and open up a file. Let's call it uh, dictionary.py and actually implement this API, but using Python, and therefore Python syntax and the equivalent. And then if we have time, we can take a look at a new uh, speller.py, which is a porting or translation of speller.c, which we haven't looked at yet, but CS50 students do in the class, uh, that actually implements the spell checker itself. But the real intellectual work and the data structure stuff really takes place in dictionary.c or today, dictionary.py. So let me go ahead and proactively save this as dictionary.py so we get our syntax highlighting. And let me propose that we just have placeholders initially for those four functions. So again, we can't use dictionary.py with speller.c. And so this is just a porting of the whole project to another language. So in Python, you declare functions using slightly different syntax. In Python, you don't specify a return type and you don't specify the types of your arguments to functions, but you do specify their names. And recall that one of those names was check. Uh, it does take an argument in this case, which we'll call word, just as we did in C. But you have to define the function, which in Python uses the def keyword. And then of course, instead of curly braces in Python, if you're familiar, uh, you instead indent, and instead of using those curly braces, often with colons implying that here comes some indentation. And I'm not ready to do this yet, so I'm just going to say pass, sort of literally passing on implementing the function, but we'll come back to that. But that will get the IDE here. We're using CS50 IDE or Cloud9 to just stop yelling at us with some, some red marks. And quite welcome for the uh, pass by uh, value question there. So let's go ahead and do two others. Let's go ahead and define load, and load takes in a dictionary. Uh, here too, I'm just going to pass for now on actually implementing it. I'm going to go ahead and implement size, which takes no arguments. So you just specify open paren, close paren. You don't need to say void as you do in C. Let's pass on implementing that for now. And then unload, which frankly, we're probably not going to need it all in Python because memory is managed for you. You might have to allocate it, albeit implicitly, uh, but you're not going to have to worry about managing it like in C. So there's the API ported to Python. And again, you'll notice no return types and no parameter types, Python's loosely typed. It still has types, strings, and ints, and, and floats, and other values, but it doesn't actually require that the programmer like us actually specify those things. All right, so what do you think we should do to think about this? We have to implement a, a dictionary for a spell checker. A dictionary, by definition, is a whole bunch of words that are passed in in a big text file. How would you go about thinking about how to begin solving this in Python? I think the first thing I would want to do is understand the dictionary file okay. so that we can parse it and we can load it into the dictionary probably. Okay. All right. Well, so if we want to parse the dictionary file, it's, it's nice that we're actually in Python because it's even easier in Python than in C where you have to really think about how long your lines are and how many bytes of memory you might need. So let me go ahead and go up there. Uh, let's implement load first, or at least the beginning of it. And if I want to open a file in Python, it's actually as simple as saying open the file name, dictionary being the file name, and then you can specify, do you want to read the file or maybe read and write the file? And so just as in C with the fopen function, if you recall, you can say quote unquote read, which just says, hey Python, open the file called dictionary or whatever that value actually is, and then read it for me. Uh, but this is going to return essentially a, a file handle to the file, so to speak, kind of like a reference there too. So I want to keep that around and I'm just going to declare a variable on the left called file, but I could call it anything I want, f or whatever. Um, and assign that the return value of open. Notice I don't have to specify the type of file. Uh, it's going to return, it's going to store some kind of file object, but I don't need to worry about that. And now in C, you would probably proceed to iterate using like fread or fscanf or fgets or fgetc or any number of other file IO reading functions. But in Python, there's these higher level abstractions where if you know that text file just contains Word, after word after word, you can just say that as say as much in Python by literally saying, you know what, for each line in the file, go ahead and do this. And so just as I kind of rattled that off verbally, so you can you type it in Python, and it's a lot more English-like, if you will, in that sense. Now, I don't really know what we want to do with this word yet, so let's just say for now, store word in some data structure, because that's kind of an interesting design question to come back to. Um, but once we're done doing that, we're just going to go ahead and call uh, close on the file, or rather, <laughs> I'm using C syntax already, we're going to call file close, and here's where Python is also object oriented. The file uh, reference that came back itself has functions or methods built into it, and if you look at the documentation, one of those is close, so file.close actually closes that specific file. And then after that, let's assume for the sake of discussion that everything went well, so I'm just going to go ahead 
and return true here in this case. So in uh, returning true just signifies everything is good. I do seem to have an error here, but that's only because I haven't actually done something in this for loop. So let me also just say pass on implementing that for now, and that error should go away as well. There's, a, there's an even cleaner way to uh, do what you've done with the file, right? Oh, yeah. The, uh, like using a, what's called a context manager. All right, how we do that? Like the with the with keyword. Mm -hmm. So if you have the instead of having needing to open a file handler with file, well, you still need a file handler. But instead of having uh, basically the dot close, mm -hmm. you can kind of enclose all of this sort of all these operations that require this file within its own indented block. Uh, using the with keyword, and this is essentially um, a just what's called a context manager, it manages the context of this file and the operations on it. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, it saves you a line of code. Yeah, so perfect, great point to make. This is more Pythonic, if you will. Here on line seven, what I've done, uh, per Colton's suggestion, is actually say, with the opening of this file in read only mode, call the return value file. And then notice how I've indented by tabbing everything below that line 8, 9, and 10 at the moment inside of that indentation, thereby implying that this file variable is uh, useful within every indented line underneath. And what, uh, as Colton remarks, uh, this, this notion of context is important because what's going to happen ultimately is that Python is going to close this file for me by the time we hit line 11. So I just don't need to think about it. So this is a very common approach, just to kind of clean up your thinking, focus on the work you actually care about, which is opening the file and getting at it. It's less interesting intellectually to close the file. And indeed, much better if the language itself deals with that overhead for you. Plenty of people forget to close their files in C as well. Uh, indeed. In fact, one of the most common sources of memory leaks where you allocate RAM and forget to give it back is indeed because you forgot to close some data structure like a file. We have a few people in the chat. Uh, we have Trebinator says, greetings from Germany. Greetings from America. Uh, Amit, Microsoft India says, greetings from India. Nice to meet you, Amit, as well, from Cambridge. And then uh, Srinivasank has another. says, comment in line 9 is stores W. Comment in line 9. Store word in some data structure. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Line. So entire line uh, instead of one. Yes, it is. So tech, well, it depends what I do with this. So I can save myself here. I haven't actually written this line of code, so I can claim it's going to do whatever I want. But yes, if we do no other action here in the commented line on line 9, yeah, we'd be storing the whole line. But if we assume, as we're allowed to in CS50C version of the PSET, that the dictionary contains words, one word per line, then, with a bit of fanciness, can I actually extract from that line the one and only one word that's on it, get rid of maybe any leading or trailing white space or messiness, and just load that word. And indeed, that's the to-do on line 9 that remains. For context, do, we, do you happen to have the dictionary file available for us to look at? Yeah, absolutely. If you want to take a look at the dictionary, let's go into another folder. Uh, and in that folder, we have a dictionaries folder. And I'm going to go ahead and open up a large dictionary here, which has got like 140,000 words. And even the, the IDE here was struggling for a moment to open it. Okay. And here we go. So here are the lines in the file. A is the shortest English word I can think of that starts with A. Apparently, AAA and AAAS uh, have Triple meaning a. too. So Ardvark. So we've gone ahead. Have we, so we've lowercased all the words in this case in advance? We have. And so that's kind of an assumption we're making. If we didn't want to make that assumption, that's fine. We can deal with it in code. But yes, that would have been one of the setups in the C version of the problem, which is that, yeah, it's all lowercase. We got uh, Forza 1Z, uh, sorry, Forza 1SRA. Greetings from Italy. Hello, Forza. One SR. Buongiorno, Forza. <laughs> we have uh, SB Venner. Greetings from London. Nice. Hello. Good to see you. Nice from uh, Cambridge here. Srinivasan, sorry if I'm jumping. No, that's okay. That's totally fine. It's good. I think it was a good thing to uh, to catch. Yeah. That no, that's fine. Call me on anything that we're <laughs> missing here. So if you want to see all 140,000 words. We can scroll here for quite a while. You can see there's a lot of A words in English. And this is why it's actually important at the end of the day to think about how much memory you're using, how many CPU cycles you're using, because at the end of the day, this is going to add up. And indeed, I've, not even, I've gotten bored with scrolling. We haven't even gotten through all of the A words. So and there's a lot of words there. And that's why we have a small and a large, I'm guessing, so that we have a, <laughs> a dichotomy. We can performance measure between the small, but our algorithm operating on the small database versus the large yes. database. You do not want to try to debug a problem in your code with 140,000 inputs coming at you. Can you even imagine setting like a breakpoint in a debugger <laughs> and walking through that? Uh, that would be so we have small, which just has two words, cat <laughs> and caterpillar. So this is actually fun fact. So this is kind of curious that we have these two words. Well, wh why might you, in writing some test code, use two words like this as opposed to cat and dog? 
Uh, I'm thinking from the perspective of the tri, because they're both going to operate on the same nodes in the tree, mm. cat, and then caterpillar. This yeah. Caterpillar is kind of a superset of cat in that sense. Um, that's my first inclination. Yeah, no, and that, that was the motivation because you want to try to think when testing your code of potential corner cases, and it's definitely potentially worrisome if two of your words are so similar but different. So whether you're using a try or anything else, just choosing those kinds of corner cases, one letter words, two letter words, substrings of other words is really good defensive mindset to go into. Uh, uh, debugging with. Oh, fun fact too. Uh, it was just a few years ago that I learned how to spell caterpillar because it <laughs> occurred to me since childhood I could pronounce this word. I knew what a caterpillar was. And then the one time off the cuff I said, oh, why don't we spell check caterpillar? I had to Google the darn word in the front of class. Uh, how'd, you, how'd you think it was spelled? A cat, a cat a pillar. Cat, I don't know. Oh, you just take for granted for yeah. you know 30 years. It's a weird, it's a weird word. I, I yeah. There's other words like that. Too. I was embarrassed. So. Shane Song says, "Sorry, I didn't realize that dictionary file contains only one word." Alone. No need to apologize. We didn't tell you, so you wouldn't have known. No big deal. All right, so let's go back to the Python API that we've been in the midst of implementing here and see if we can't flesh this out a little more. So I feel like the big to-do is really this. We've kind of cut some corners and we've only thought about, <laughs> we have a special guest here today. Uh, we've only really thought about what to do logically, but where are we gonna tuck this data away? So how do you think about, how should anyone think about actually storing these words, would you say? Well, in CS50, I think normally we use what's called a hash table. So some way for us to essentially map mm -hmm. a word to some storage some storage bucket somewhere using a function that's optimized for even distribution of our words so we don't have all of the same words in like basically one long linked list. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we should show people maybe how to implement a hash table in Python. Oh, yeah. You want to do a hash table in Python? Yeah, let's do a hash table in all Python. All right. So if you want to declare a hash table, for instance, a variable called hash table in Python, uh, you could technically just do that. Oh, wow. Um, and then done. What would you like me to do next? Uh, well, so now I think <laughs> <laughs> done. I think, we're, I think we're all set. Kind of. But this actually does invite some interesting design questions. So this is indeed the definition of a hash table, or in Python it's called a dictionary, or dict, um, where you map keys to values. And that's the fundamental definition of a hash table. It's a mapping of keys to values. But so cat equals one, dog equals two, for example. It could be, yeah, but you don't have to use numeric indices like that. Like, it really suffices in a dictionary to say yes or no, the word is in it. So you could probably just say cat, true, dog, true, caterpillar, true. But even that feels a little redundant. And so when it comes to designing a data structure like this, hash table might not necessarily need be what you want. You can actually use bunches of others. So you could actually get away with just using a list in Python, which is a dynamically resizable array or vector if you're coming from the C++ world. Um, that's nice too because it will automatically grow to fill the data and you're also not unnecessarily storing true, 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 or one, two, three, four. You're just storing the words themselves, the keys. Um, More efficient in terms of memory, so memory. Yeah, I mean, you're saving some number of bytes. However Python implements true and false, it's got to be non-zero, presumably. Yeah. But would you ha caution against using just a list, would you say? I would for access purposes, because if you want to find out whether something's in a list, it's going to be an O of N operation. Yeah, so an O of N, big O of N, the linear time operation, because if that word like is zoo, and it's all the way at the end of your list, if it's alphabetized, then you know, you got to search all 140,000 words just looking for the darn word that you care about. We had a couple questions also. Uh, yeah. Trebinator, are you doing PSET 5 in Python? Yes. Yes, essentially. And yeah. fun fact, PSET 5 just became PSET 4 this year, so stay tuned for CS50X 2019. And you want to read off uh, SP Venner's last question? Yeah, there too? sure. SP Venner's asks, uh, what is the past uh, reserve keyword do in Python? I've not really seen that before. Steve? Uh, so it's actually just kind of literally a pass. When you want to just have a placeholder line that does nothing, as I'm doing here sort of pedagogically, you can just say pass. That's a bit of a contrived use case. It really means when you need a line of code but you don't want to take any action there, you can use pass. So just to pull up a separate file here, let me just create foo.py for the sake of discussion. This would not be the best design, but it's one possible use of this. If you wanted to say something like uh, if x is greater than y, but in that case, you don't want to do anything about it, you could just say pass. Now, I say this is bad design because, frankly, if you just want to check a condition and then not do something, and instead do something only if the opposite is true, like uh, do this, you can just flip the logic, frankly. And you can instead say if x is less than or equal to y, then do this, and you can avoid the pass altogether. But I've been in the habit on some applications of actually using it in the context of exceptions. So we don't tend to talk about these in CS50, but you might in a higher level class uh, or in your own professional work. 
Often it's the case in Python that you want to try to do something inside of which you might have some lines of code, except something bad might happen. And so you might say, except exception as E for exception. But if you want to do something uh, with the exception, uh, you might not want sometimes to do something with the exception, but you do want to catch it and then ignore it because you know more than the computer and you know that sometimes an exception might happen. But if you decide not a big deal, you can literally just say pass effectively ignoring the exception, but still handling it so the whole program doesn't abort. So I would say that's a more compelling use of pass that's not pedagogical, but it is functional. Essentially, because in Python, if you try to do like a, like a function definition without a body, it'll just give you a compiler error. Yeah. Right. Yeah, indeed. So if you actually want to have the equivalent of like abstract methods inside of a class that you then override in a child class, you might just say pass because you don't want the function to have to do anything by default, but it does need to be well defined grammatically in the language. Exactly. Really good question. Keep them coming. Hope that helps, Steve. All right, so if we turn our attention back to dictionary.py, I would propose we could take this one step further. Python has a whole uh, buffet, if you will, of data structures, not just lists, not just hash tables, but it also has one that we introduce in class, albeit briefly. It actually has what are called sets. You might not have thought about these recently, but uh, mathematically a set is a collection of numbers typically, but a key, uh, key detail is that the set does not contain duplicates, which is great because your dictionary probably shouldn't contain duplicates. Uh, the word is either a word or it's not. And so a set is kind of nice because it maintains that property. But more importantly, if you read the documentation for Python, set is more performant than list. It will give you an approximation of constant time access. So it's probably implemented with a hash table underneath the, uh, underneath the hood, much like a dictionary. But uh, it does have this property where you can just think about membership therein, not an association of keys with values. It's kind of like the hash table, but rather than even to store that true every time, which mm -hmm. like you said, probably amounts to some non-zero amount of bytes, mm -hmm. uh, we just get all of that sort of for free with the same functionality. It's a membership check. Yeah, indeed. And so a set is what you would often call an abstract data type. You don't necessarily know or have to care how it's implemented underneath the hood. All you care about is its properties. The fact that you can add to it, remove from it, and get an approximately constant time access to it. That's what you care about, but underneath the hood, it probably is implemented with some kind of tree or hash table or anything that's not for us to worry about in a language like Python. So let's call this actually what it is. This is our dictionary of words. So let's just say we've got a variable called words, and it's initialized to be just an empty set containing no words initially until we're ready to put them into the file. We had a question from Andre. Andre, uh, we see Andre on the Facebook group all the time, actually. Indeed. Hey, Andre. Hello, Andre. Nice to see you here on Twitch. Would checking access aligned bounding box collisions be a good use case for pass since you are typically testing whether four cases are not true? Um, in that case, you still would check all four conditions. So I don't think you would, because you want to make sure all of them um, aren't true, um, because that's just part of how that algorithm works. Um, so yeah, I don't think pass in that particular instance would be appropriate. Yeah, you can still flip the logic even if syntactically it starts to get a little messy or sloppy. Generally, in any language, having just empty uh, code blocks where you take no action or explicitly say pass, it usually suggests that better design is possible. Yeah, I usually see it as like a non-implemented sort of thing, like yeah. this to do. It's like in the real world, at least in the US and in English, you sometimes have silly business or legal documents that say, this page intentionally left blank. I mean, everyone kind of rolls their eyes at that because, well, this is kind of silly. And I think the same idea there. You don't want to just have placeholders for code. You want to get the logic right from the get-go. Cool. Good question. Though. Yeah, nice to see you here on another venue. All right, so this line nine still kind of remains, store line in some data structure. So honestly, this is pretty straightforward in Python. If I have this data structure called words and I just want to go ahead and add to it, I can literally just add the line to the, uh, to the set. Now, this isn't quite right. And uh, you noticed this earlier, I think, um, uh, one of our, uh, who is it? God. Uh, I think Srini, uh, Srini Shrim Nash K. Yes, he noted earlier that doesn't it contain a full line? And it does. But if we know that the dictionary contains one word per line, but every line probably ends with a backslash n or crlf or the like, we're, wanna gonna, we're gonna wanna strip that off. And if you read the CS50 specification, you'll know that indeed it ends with backslash n or a new line or a line feed. So what's nice in Python is you can actually strip this off pretty nicely. You can say reverse strip r strip a specific character or characters from the end of the string, hence a right strip from the end. And that's actually going to uh, strip off one or more new lines from the end of the string, thereby giving us effectively the whole word from nice. the file. Clean. 
And that's it. Now, even though Colton and I have been talking for quite a few minutes here, I mean, at the end of the day, we wrote, what, like six or so lines of code to get done much of a CS50 problem, uh, namely the load function here. So let's do let's uh, take a bit of a breather and let's go ahead and just implement size. This function, according to the problem statement, is return the uh, number of words in the in the file, uh, in the dictionary file, which is now loaded into memory, presumably. How would you go about thinking about this? Um, well, one approach might be to use some sort of loop to basically okay. go over our data structure and say for in Python, for example, for something in our collection for word in words, um, and then just increment the counter that you've declared size. So size plus equals one. Um, and then, yeah, just return, return the size. The size. Yeah, okay. Exactly. All right, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, it feels like if words is a data structure, uh, it probably supports the notion of length. Could we whittle this down into something more Pythonic? Yeah, most, most I would say most abstract data types probably do have some sort of length mm -hmm. function or length uh, field on them. So um, I believe you can just call len on yeah. set the length function, which is a function that works on pretty much any uh, core Python data structure. Um, and that should just give you the number of words. It should be stored internally. Indeed. And this is a nice generalization. It's a little inconsistent across Python that you don't call words.lang, but this is essentially an API in Python. Lang, or length, is a function that works across various different data structures and data types and can even work across your own customized ones that you yourself invent. Um, so long as your data structure implements itself a sort of a magical method called lang itself, uh, which is built into the object, this len function will call that length method, thereby making sure that you can get the length of any data structure in a standard way in this case. So actually just letting the data structure, the set itself, tell us what's your length, it could probably now be done in constant time instead of linear. And again, that's the goal, speed everything up today. Um, well, let's do a spoiler here with unload in Python. Even though in C, you would have to allocate all this memory, maybe it's on the stack or the heap or wherever, once you've decided that, you have to actually free that memory. In Python, mm -mm, there's really no work to be done here, so I'm just going to go ahead and boldly say done. Like turn true. Yeah. What, what's the mechanism called that sort of uh, does that for us? Uh, so it would be uh, called garbage collection. Uh, and uh, whew, wasn't sure if that's what you were fishing for there. <laughs> uh, it'd be called garbage collection, which is kind of a cool way of describing a process that happens behind the scenes whenever the program isn't really doing much else or has a breather or just needs to collect garbage, it will free up any memory that you seem not to, actually, that you are known not to be using anymore so that it can be used for other purposes in your program or somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Woo, one Languages point like me. Java and Ruby and such also include, typically interpreted languages and some compiled languages have this feature. Gotcha. C definitely does not have this feature. Though. No, no, and that's what makes it all the more painful sometimes to use. And Srini, you got it. Uh, thank you for the summary there to everyone. A few people have some long, long usernames here today. So we're kind of left with just one function that we passed on earlier, literally, that is the check. So check recall is going to be the function that we're going to call again and again and again to spell check any of the words that are actually passed in. So let's consider how we can go implement this up top. We know that the data structure in question is called words. It's a set. And it turns out it's pretty easy to just ask the question, is this string in this set? You can literally just say something like, if word in set, then go ahead and return true. Or if that's not the case, with your colons here, you can go ahead and return false. But in Python, anytime you find yourself in the habit of very verbosely saying, if this, then return true, else if that, return false, you can probably whittle it down even more cleanly. And indeed, you can actually do this in C, uh, though we tend not to do it in the earliest weeks of CS50. I could actually just be a little more elegant here and just say what? Uh, return word in words. And that in itself is a Boolean expression that will return true or false. Um, I might want to do one enhancement here, and you would only know this from reading the problem statement. Even though the dictionary that we were given with 140,000 words is uh, sorted and all lowercase is in the problem statement, the file you're spell checking might not be, because that could be any file that some human typed out. So we should probably, if we're looking for words in a lowercase dictionary, we should probably force every word that we're being passed to lowercase just to make sure that we're comparing uh, apples and apples, so to speak. Good point. Yeah. So any questions then on how we've tackled this? Believe it or not, in 17 lines or fewer, can you implement a spell checker in Python that conforms to CS50's own API, which takes many more lines and undoubtedly many, many, many more hours, if not tears, in C? to implement. Sure, maybe wait a couple minutes for questions. Well, in the meantime, uh, when was the first year that we had this piece set? Do you remember? 
I do remember in CS50 here at Harvard, 2007. And uh, AI has yet to replace uh, spell checkers, so we haven't had to replace it yet. Is it, did you come up with this from scratch, or was this an inherited piece of I did come up with this from scratch, I believe. It's a while ago now. And in fact, I think I first wrote this piece set or problem set even years prior. Let's roll back to like 2002 or 2003. I was teaching at Tufts University, another school up the road in their computer science department, and was making all new homework assignments for that class. And I think, unless I'm rewriting history here, I think I did write that from scratch way back when. And it's evolved a little bit over time. And in fact, it started off as a C++ problem set, if this was true. Um, that, or I'm completely making all of this up, and in 2007 did I first write this piece set. Was it because you are having issues with words, spell checker? Issues with words? No, I mean, we had Microsoft Word in my day, and so <laughs> word spell you can uh, actually just ask the software to do this. Z Alien's got a couple kappas for us. That's, uh, uh, hey Z Alien, good to see you. Thank you very much. Trepanator, love your course and style of teaching. Currently working on Oh, thank you. Oh, piece set 5 in C. I'm sorry we showed you the answer in Python, otherwise this piece set would have gotten a little easier. A little yeah. disheartening. Dictionary.h, the file we started with is actually given to students, so that's not even a spoiler there. So fun fact, uh, when I was a kid, Microsoft Word came on four floppy disks. Oh, man. And it had all the features I actually needed or cared about back in, what, like 1995, give or take, uh, Microsoft Word 5.1a. How much smaller was the dictionary back then? We had as many words, I think, in English, <laughs> although you hear about more and more stupid words coming out every year that are apparently immortalized in the dictionary. I can't remember any from this year. I don't know. You, you always you kind of roll the, your You eyes. have the floppy from, from Word in your office. Do I? At 125, don't you? Oh, maybe. Or Excel. Yeah. You know, you have the Excel floppy disk. Oh, possibly, yeah. It was cool. Actually, a few a couple of years ago now, CS50's uh, video team went on the road to visit our friends at Microsoft, so I probably shouldn't have said ill things about Microsoft <laughs> Word just now. Uh, and they have a wonderful archive, and we got to explore some of the boxes and shelves of old stuff, and they just had all of the oldest software right there on floppy disk. We have some fun photos of picking up like entire boxes of really, really heavy products, but the stupid thing is, the heavy products was not like the actual software, it was the damn like instruction manuals. They used to come with like dictionary sized user manuals that uh, we uh, that uh, we held up above our head. I don't think I can find the photo on on such quick demand. Yeah, that's that's okay. maybe. Can we do that? All right. Let's. So um, CS 50s own Dan Coffee here is suggesting that we go to our own uh, photo website here. So let's see if we can't dig up a little memory from yesteryear. Uh, if I go here, I think we can probably search. Trini's asking, is that a 3.5 inch floppy disk? Oh, did you already answer that question? Here we, hey, look at this. Hey, look at that search. That's a good dictionary we've got here. <laughs> wow. So this is me looking very surprised at how heavy uh, Microsoft Office was uh, a, really a long time ago. That's really how big the manuals ago. were? Are those the manuals or the full software? This is mostly the manuals. So let's enhance here. And yeah, there were a few floppy disks or maybe CDs by then in oh, there, yeah. but those are mostly manuals. That's not even the biggest one. Here we go. This is Visual C++. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> That's the compiler. Wow. Wow, that's, that's me a long time ago, too. That's a compiler uh, in the manuals for it. Um, slightly creepily, too, uh, okay, is that photo, but also Microsoft, <laughs> apparently, what are those called? Teletubbies? Teletubbies, yeah. Micro Teletubbies used to be powered by Microsoft? Microsoft did, I, don't even, I have no idea. Yeah. Windows 3.1 was distributed on eight 3.5 inch floppies, says Andre. I believe it, 100%. Indeed, indeed. Oh, and it's apropos here. Off camera is our friend Dan Coffey, who's right there on camera uh, with that. So, and then of course it wouldn't be CS50 without our friend Natasha Chorneski and Nacho, uh, who's at Microsoft with other colleagues of her as well. And there she is, CS50 proud, having taken CS50 herself. Do you, do you remember Prashrini's comment whether it was 3.5 or 5.5 inch floppies? Uh, if, uh, let's see. For Office, you know, I don't. In my day, the w version we had, but on Macs, was 3.5. But I, I don't think Macs ever had five point uh, and a quarter inch discs. Uh, oh, but sure. Windows might have certainly. Oh, if yeah, there was true. Windows, I mean DOS and Windows 3.1 and onward might have. Yeah, I, I remember having a Windows 95 machine with floppies on it, but I don't. It's been a long time. Yeah. Hey, we're all sounding really old right now. So <laughs> if there's any of you kids tuning in wondering what the hell this channel just became, <laughs> I think we we should have prefaced it with a picture of what a floppy disk is. That is true. So here, let's do that. What's a floppy disk? Floppy disk. They come in different shapes and forms. They're mostly died out now. You used to have really good presentation in CS50 where you would have people rip open a floppy. Yeah. You still have those in storage, by the way. We do still have some floppy disks in stock. Yeah. Fun fact. 
fact, it was uh, it actually got really expensive to do because the price of storage and media just went down and down and down and down. And so for a few pennies, we could give a thousand students in the room their own floppy disk and then tear it apart in class. But then once nobody started using them, you could only get them on like eBay, not That's even true. Staples. And so then it's like a dollar each, and that makes for a really expensive demo. I remember when we bulk ordered those. There were like thousands of them. Yeah. So that's a. this is a somewhat hard floppy disk. Inside is the actual floppy material. And then as um, uh, Srini was referring, we had uh, five and a quarter inch disks and even bigger ones back <laughs> in the day. Uh, uh, small, medium, and large, if you will. And I kind of started off life, I think, with the middle disks there. But oh, fun fact too, if we ha enhance this, um, these five and a quarter inch floppy disks, which were indeed flexible, came with a little divot out of the corner, which was help to help align them so you would know which is on the left and which is on the right so you don't put the disk in upside down. But the catch is that the materials inside the disk are actually perfectly symmetric. And so if you actually take a scissors or a special $5 device, you could snip a hole in the floppy disk exactly symmetrically on the other side, thereby tricking the floppy disk drive to write bits onto the other side of the actual floppy disk inside. Now, I'm sure if I had any notion of electrical engineering at the time, I would know that this just creates interference and bad things. But to a kid trying to you know, double his storage space, it doubled my storage space. So all of us used to do this and make your floppy disk double-sided. That's a TIO for me. I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, well, it probably wasn't recommended. The better practice would be just buy more floppy disks, but uh, <laughs> that that's what we did back in the day. Yeah, no, that's cool. It's, yeah. nice. it's a good piece of history. Yeah, so any questions from the audience there? Anything we can pluck off, either on C, Python, or anything in between? Yeah, if you guys have any uh, sort of small exercises or you know examples you want us to implement in Python, let us know. Um, we, you said potentially resize as well. Is that one that you have? I can print that for you. If we you do have it. resize, but I think we also have the speller, which we could go from. Oh, that's true. Yeah, C yeah, to yeah. Python. We have the other speller. Yeah, we could do that. All if right. Folks are interested. We should maybe we let people <laughs> decide what they want. My dad still has a few of those in both sides. Um, uh, do folks prefer us to do resize or to take a closer look at speller and C? Maybe get a chance for some feedback. I do think speller and C is nice because we can literally do it side by side. That's true. That's a good point. That's a good point. Line up. That's a good point. All right, so let's do let's, that. Let's start on that. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So <laughs> let's go ahead and let me unenhance, close a couple of our uh, distractions there. Let me go into my same folder as before. Let me go ahead and open up speller.c, which is indeed the version of this program that students are given. So I'm afraid to, this won't help you out. Uh, with uh, Trebinator with PSET 5, since you two are given this distribution code. But what's nice about the IDE here is we can split our windows and actually do some side-by-side -side coding and essentially comport or translate C from Python from left to right here. And so we could also do this magic, and now we're out of the scene. Look at that. Oh, nice. We can even get rid of you and me. <laughs> nice. All right. So here we go. Let me go ahead and create a new file. We'll call this uh, speller.py. And essentially, we're going to try to recreate this file over at the right-hand side. So we'll do some simple, some more sophisticated things for a moment. Uh, <laughs> you can keep, keep watching, Trebinator. We won't show you dictionary.c. That's where the real magic is. Actually, do you, want me to, um, do you want me to maybe make a smaller and put us in the middle so we can still see? Yeah, can we Yeah, let's do that. unenhance us? Let's here we go. That. Woo! Goodbye. Let's do oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, we could do a little Mac versus PC, like C versus Python thing here now. <laughs> Uh, I think I should get on the other side then. Yeah, this is kind of backwards, <laughs> but the keyboards, that's okay. We'll all look this way, you look this way, <laughs> and we'll focus on our own code. All right, so one thing to note, first of all, in Python, there's, there's different ways to write comments. Um, and so for multi-line comments like this, how would you go about writing them in your file? Uh, in C or in, oh, in Python? In Python. In Python. Uh, Python has a cool syntax. I mean, one way you could do it is just preface every single line with the hash mark. Okay, so, so we could do, do that. every single line like Which this. Which would get very tedious. Yeah, for sure. Um, Python has another way you can do it using either triple uh, full quotes or single quotes, uh -huh, yeah. which will allow you to do the same thing essentially as this, except on the left, but you don't need to have the star on each line. You can just write strings literally as you want. Yeah, so problem set five, uh, implements a spell checker, and then down here, we can close that thought using double or single quotes, so long as we're actually consistent across the two. And now, now those are our comments. And you can see it's nicely highlighted. It's color-coded a little differently just because the IDE treats comments in C and Python a little differently. But same exact idea. I think Srini had the right idea. He had the triple hash mark, but just the uh, off on just the quote being the, the key there. Indeed. Definitely want to use the single or the double quotes there and then be consistent throughout. So on the left in C, we had a whole bunch of header files that we included, one of which was our own, dictionary.h, and then a bunch of which were some lower level things really used for instrumentation. No, no problem at all. 
and the comparables that we'll need are a little different. So there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping left to right. Um, and in fact, rather than do these preemptively, we'll come back to some of our imports and let's just trip over the libraries we need once we actually get to them. Otherwise, it's magical just by knowing where we're going with this. But I will say this. We do know that there's a file called dictionary.py from earlier. So I can immediately say, you know what, from dictionary, go ahead and import those functions. Check load, size, and unload. Those are the four functions we did implement earlier. And this way, we can just keep the logic of our spell checker separate from the implementation details of the dictionary. Could even swap in and out different dictionaries if we want, and therefore implement the API in different ways. Basically how you would port a header file, the idea of a header file from C into Python. Yeah, exactly. Now, I've seen in some code, and frankly some of my own code, this approach. W what would this do? Do you know? So uh, from dictionary import star means star being sort of like the glob or the catch-all mm -hmm. sort of operator in Unix and other systems. Um, basically means everything. So from dictionary, from the dictionary.py file, just import everything mm. and, and pretend like I wrote those in my own file. So I'll have access to check, I'll have access to unload, I'll have access to size, all those different ones. Yeah, and that otherwise seems pretty handy, right? Because then I don't have to enumerate all four of those functions. But the catch is you can potentially scoop in more than you intend. So for instance, we had a global variable in that file called words, which was that set. And by scooping it up with star, we're accidentally introducing to this namespace, so to speak, speller.py, that same variable, which means I could somehow accidentally screw up and mutate or change that variable when it really is meant to be used only by the dictionary. Now we can defend against that in a bunch of ways. We can introduce classes in dictionary.py. We can introduce an actual module and kind of separate that out. But in general, just because star is convenient does not mean it's good design. And in fact, it would be more conventional and proper to enumerate even tediously uh, the functions that you actually care about so that you're importing only what it is you care about and nothing extra, especially if someone else goes and changes the, the implementation of the dictionary and all of a sudden your, your variables are, are colliding. Exactly. All right, so I've imported the dictionary. Um, let's go ahead now and start translating some of the code. And for the most part, it'll line up, but not necessarily one for one. So we can point out some of the differences as we go. And sure. we might even disagree how we might implement things. But we'll try to do it line for line uh, here. So over here on line 20 in our C version was the definition of a constant, as it would be called. It's by convention in all caps. And then this just hard codes the path to that big file with like 140,000 words. Um, what would you propose be the equivalent in Python here? Um, well, Python doesn't really have the idea, or at least the hard-coded idea, of constant variables, yeah. unfortunately. Um, so what I would probably just do is something like capital dictionary, just like you okay. have right there, yeah. gets uh, then the string dictionary slash large. So almost the same thing. Um, just without the define being necessary. So if you can capitalize the word, though, is this not now just a constant? Uh, not in, in uh, functionality, but sort of ad, like not ad hoc, but sort of implicitly a constant. We can, yeah. Other programmers reading this are going to say, see the fact that dictionary is all capitalized, and just by convention across multiple programming languages, all capitalized uh, variables with underscores tend to be constants, mm. even if that idea is not enforced by the compiler or interpreter. Yeah, and this is just kind of a language decision. The reality is that uh, different communities of, and different languages, authors disagree, and the sort of mentality with Python is, well, yeah, you could change that value, but just don't, and be a little yeah. more mature about it. Now, it goes both ways. I mean, that's fine to be said, and OK, I promise not to touch that variable. But when programs get big and complicated, you might forget which is yours, which is someone else, even though the capitalization is supposed to help. So a lot of languages, C among them, Java, C++, really try to protect you from yourself, albeit at a price of tedium, when you have to write even more code or more thinking just to get the same kind of work done. Exactly. All right, so that's a pretty straightforward translation of that line. Uh, below that is a prototype, which in C is a proactive declaration of a function's name, uh, return value, and arguments, at least the types and order thereof. Um, there isn't really a comparable in Python, so we'll skip over that. And in Python 2, there isn't necessarily a main function. You can absolutely have one, but we won't bother because there's actually going to be no other functions in this file, so we'll keep it simple. Um, and so let's focus on argc here. In C, argc is the argument count, the number of arguments that have been passed in. Um, but in Python, you have to do this a little differently. Um, we need a module, right? We do, yeah, because Python, like C, gives you argc and argv sort of for free yeah. um, as part of its implementation, but it's not something that's necessarily part of Python's implementation. Um, real quick, though, Sri has a, a question. All caps mean generally object oh. or class? Sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, good question. 
Right. You, want, you want to find out? Oh, you're testing me again, huh? <laughs> uh, all caps generally means either you're yelling in an email or a text message or whatever, yeah. uh, or uh, sorry for those of you wearing headphones, actually, <laughs> uh, or it means a constant or a social agreement that this should be a constant value uh, when only the first letter is capitalized or... Uh, you have a multi-word variable name or a symbol that has capitalization throughout but not the whole thing, that typically signifies yes, a class. And then if you use more traditional camel case, uh, like lowercase letters to begin or more conventionally underscore variables names, uh, otherwise known as snake case, then that's just a variable typically. Snake case because of Python? No, I think that lot, I think that name comes from back in the day because it looks like a snake. Like it's just your long string of words. Oh, interesting. With okay. the underscore. It's, hey, you learned something new here on CS50 Live. It's interesting how coincidental that is, though. Snake case. Why? Because Python. Oh, interesting. No, I'm pretty sure it predates it, but I'm sure Wikipedia could answer this too. That's fascinating. We'll check, and next week we'll <laughs> we'll let you know. Um, so we it, to gain access to our uh, command line arguments in Python. We need to import uh, the system module, which actually gives us access to that and a bunch more features. Or frankly, if we want to be a little more precise and make it look a little more like C, we can just say from the sys library, import argv, or argument vector, which is a subset of the functionality therein. And so down here, if I actually want to check, did the user run this program with the right number of command line arguments, I can actually say something like, well, if the length, oops, if the length of argv, whoops, uh, equals to, uh, or rather does not equal to, and length of argv does not equal three, then I can go ahead and exit and complain. So I can actually do this in a couple different ways. In Python, you generally use print instead of printf. Uh, so you would say usage, speller, and then if I mimic exactly what we have in C, I would do something like this. Uh, this is going to be the name of the program if I actually add a shebang and put it in a file called speller or install it via package. Uh, dictionary is in uh, square brackets because it's meant to be optional. That's the file that you want to load optionally and then text is the file name that you actually want to spell check. Um, and then I can go ahead just like in Python, uh, just like in C, exit with a certain value but for this I need to do exit one. Uh, which if I want to return a one status code, I would do that. But honestly, you can actually do this a little more simply and get rid of all that. And you can just exit with a string. And if you read the documentation for Python, when you do exit with a string, it's going to return uh, one for you, but it's also going to print out that value. Now, Python or the IDE here isn't liking this because I've done something wrong. Oh, I'm taking C2 literally. <laughs> you have to literally say you. and Woo! professionals here <laughs> uh, and change it back to some human English. And so uh, because dictionary is optional, that means that we're going to essentially use that hard-coded as a default, I'm guessing? Exactly. That's why we have the line 14, a constant that we'll use as a default. Why? Just because we decided that we don't want to force the student to have to specify a dictionary every time they run their program. Uh, instead, we want them to be, have some default built in. And we saw a len before uh, the len function when we used a set, and now we're mm. using it on, on argv. Yeah. So what is argv? What is the data structure that argv is if it's a, following the same model of data structures being able to use the length function? Yeah, in this case, it's, it happens to be a list. And this is a list of the command line arguments that the human is presumed to have typed in from, bracket, uh, from index location 0 on up. And so lang just tells us the length of that list, just like lang in the context of sets gives us the whole size of the, uh, <coughs> the set itself. OK, awesome. All right. So we're already trimming away some lines, right? We're on line 17 instead of 32. So it's a little more compact. And frankly, a lot of our lines were comments anyway. <laughs> So let's proceed here. Now in C, we had to do something a little different using uh, certain structs or data structures uh, called R usage structs before and after. Um, we don't strictly need those in Python because we can actually time our program a little more cleanly, but more on that in just a moment. But you'll notice that in C, we did define a few variables, time load, time check, time size, and time unload. All of seem, which seem to be floats because they have decimal points in them and they're all initialized to zero. Um, I did this on one line on the left hand side just because you could. Uh, you don't strictly have to do that. You got to have four separate lines or variables. But I can do m roughly the same here. I can say <coughs> time load, uh, time check, uh, time size, and uh, time unload equals 0 0.0, 0 0.0, comma 0, 0, comma 0, 0.0, comma 0, 0.0, effectively inducing what's called a tuple on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. A tuple is a collection of one or more values, often written in parentheses, but not necessarily so. But if I want to be really explicit as to what I just did, 
it's kind of like doing this, which is a nice one-liner of doing four things on the right to four things on the left. Um, and in this case, the assignment is what you're actually doing. We call them. this tuple unpacking, correct? Yeah, indeed, because you're going from a tuple with four elements in it to a tuple with four elements in it, but you're really doing a one-to-one -one mapping between all of the tuple elements. And so the parentheses are not strictly required. The commas imply the presence thereof. All right, so what else? Let's go ahead and actually initialize. Let me bring us back to the middle here. Here we go. Let's put this uh, wall between us again. There we go. All right, so now if we want to go ahead and initialize this variable dictionary to be either argv1, which is the name of the dictionary the human may be typed in, or the default, we can do this with the ternary operator here in Python as well. Uh, let me go ahead here and first, let's see what Python's complaining. Oh, accidental breakpoint, no complaints at all. Uh, let me go ahead and just initialize a dictionary variable, no type needed, to either argv1 if the length of argv equals 3, else initialize it to um, dic uh, dictionary, just like that there. So you'll see that this is a little different from C syntax in that I'm using if and else there, but this is a nice one-liner, a ternary operator effectively that's assigning dictionary to argv1 if literally length of argv is, uh, is three, else it's assigning it to dictionary. So dictionary lowercase now is our actual 100% dictionary and then capital dictionary is our ostensible dictionary when we start off if we haven't actually input a dictionary into the command line when they run the program. Exactly. Yep, yep. So And so we have here um, another example of Python code that kind of reads like English, like on line 21 here on the right, uh, dictionary equals argv1 if the length of argv is 3, else dictionary is what it equals. So it kind of reads a little more naturally than the more arcane C syntax for like ternary operator. All right, let's just do a few initializations. Again, this one doesn't map perfectly to Python because get R usage is very much a C thing. But the closest I could come up with was to declare a few variables like this. Uh, the time involved uh, before we're going to run some code. Then we're going to go ahead here and let's get a variable called loaded and call the load method, or the load function in our actual file. Then let's go ahead and get the time after that by using process time again, which is just another function, which is the same function built into the time module like this. And then just as a sanity check here, let's ask the same question. Well, wait a minute, if the dictionary was not loaded per its return value there, let's go ahead and bail out and say something like exit uh, could not load uh, dictionary. Uh, you'll notice, though, we might want to substitute in a full sentence there, so I can actually paste in the variable's value so long as I make this a format string, otherwise known as an F string. Now, the ID is yelling at us here. Do you have a sense of why this red X appeared? Um, OK, so before time dot process time. So before, I'm a little confused as to what you're doing there. <laughs> All right, well, let me <laughs> explain to you. I'll have my rubber duck here. <laughs> OK. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is just figure out what is the current time of day, if you will, right now. Okay. Then I want to call my load function. Okay. Then I want to ask another question, what is the time of day now? Because you can infer from that, presumably, if you subtract uh, after, minus, before, how many seconds, milliseconds, whatever, transpire. It's basically like having a stopwatch. Yeah, yeah. Time is like a process time function is like a stopwatch, start and then stop. Exactly. But I notice you're still getting the error, though, even though you, you put the equal sign there. Yeah. So, OK, so the IDE is helpful. It's giving us some information, undefined variable time. And so time, presumably, is a Python module, just yeah. like sys. So it looks like we just haven't included that. We at have the top to of import the time, which is kind of a magical <laughs> concept. But yeah, and that's it. Import time. What was the? What there's a fun there's a fun little thing you can do in Python. It's like import something, and it like redirects you to a web page or something, right? What is that? Oh, I don't know. But you can import functions from the future, which is uh, cool. Fr uh, Python. Hold on. Python funny import. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Uh, what is it? What is it? What is it? Uh, import this. I think. Import this. What yeah. is that? What do you mean? I think it does. Here, Python import. Let me look it up before we do it on stream. Python import I'll do it this. <laughs> Food uh, pi. You Pulton wants me to do what? Import this. Import this. You can do it in an interpreter too, and I think that'll be if you can. Fire All right. Interpreter. Slight slight digression here. Let's open a terminal window here. Let's run Python three, the latest version. Let's run a line of code with dash c and just say import this. <laughs> 
And Cute. then this is the Zen of Python by Tim Peters. That's a wonderful Easter egg. Mind you, on the second screen off camera, we're Googling <laughs> funny <laughs> Python imports. I remember that it, I didn't remember what it was, but oh, we missed a few uh, comments or uh, things in the chat here. So argv1 gets the second argument. Or wait, hey, wait, wait, wait. Let's. I want to import gra <laughs> anti gravity okay, go first. For Let's Sorry. do important Sorry. things first, Sorry. Okay. if we could. I missed that one. I missed that one. Oh, this is trying to make a connection oh, somewhere. This does. This is the one that does the web page. Here we can. Oh, really? we can do we have a computer on? Yeah, screen? I can do it on my Mac okay, here, probably. Right, sure. All right, here, Andre. Just uh, let's. Here we go. Here we go. Python three three import anti gravity. Nice. <laughs> That's amazing that this is built into an actual language in 2018. I had never actually seen that. That's pretty beautiful. I think I, I think I saw it a couple years ago, but I forgot about what, forgot what it was. Okay. Now, Srini is being a very good student here and is following along. <laughs> yes, time was missing. So, Srini, you are absolutely correct. Par apologies for the digression here. Uh, we got a little carried away with XKCD. But, yes, import time was missing. So, replacing that does actually fix that problem. And then, let's see. We had another question from uh, SB Venner. SP Venner, on line 16, would it not be a little better to say something like argv underscore len equals len argv, and then on the next line say if len underscore argv is not equal to 2 and len underscore argv is not equal to 3, it would save calling the length function method twice? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if we'll agree on this. Um, short answer, yes, theoretically. By tucking away that answer in a variable, you don't have to ask the same question again. Um, I would generally argue, though, that that is such a, it's a premature optimization, if you will. There are so many other things I could be doing poorly in this program, and just counting the number of command line arguments efficiently probably isn't one of them. The reality is, too, the human is the one that's going to be providing these command line arguments, most likely, and he or she is not going to type all that many words, so argv is probably going to be size 1, 2, 3, maybe 10, but most likely not. And so even if we are in linear time checking the length of those things, it's still going to be super fast. And frankly, if Python's interpretation of a, uh, implementation of a list is e efficient, Python is probably using its own variable to keep track of the length of a list so that it can return its length in constant time. So good instincts, but those are the kinds of details that you should generally relegate to the library and trust or check the documentation to see if it's doing things as smartly as you might be inclined. If we were incurring this function call six million times inside of a nested for loop, I would say that that would be a good point to cache that, that value. But okay, that's for, fair. For I agree this, with that. For this, I don't think that's necessary at all. Two, two function calls versus six million function calls, I think that's a different that kind of optimization. For I sure. agree. And I would say it doesn't have to be six million, right? If we're talking about a dictionary with 140,000 lines, I would worry about anything you're doing inefficiently with that input, not the human's two or three command line arguments. Sure. But yeah. totally valid, but probably not something you should worry about. Better to spend those mental cycles on, on harder problems. Exactly. Srini up above also asked, argv1 gets the second argument or the first one? Ah, so in argv0, as in C, is the name of the program itself or the name of the Python file, which would be speller.py in this case. So argv1 gets the first command line argument, but the second word that the human provided at the command line, if that distinction makes sense. And the word Python itself doesn't even get included, if I'm remembering correctly, Correct. it doesn't get included in argv at all. Correct. Just the name of the file is in argv0. In, in C, though, you do get the dot slash, whatever your script is, as the first Whatever one, the name right? of the file. But yeah. same in Python, too. If you did yeah. Python space uh, dot slash foo.py, you'd yeah. see that as well in argv0. Uh, you want to yeah. go ahead and read this question? Yeah. When having a try with a struct try letters, an array, what is init uh, letters initialized when using malloc? So. The initialization of that is totally up to you. If you're just calling malloc, it's not getting initialized with anything whatsoever. Uh, you're just getting back a chunk of memory, if uh, enough is available, equal to the amount of number of bytes that you requested. If you want to clear that memory, setting it equal to all zeros, so not technically null, null is a pointer value, but all zeros, you can use calloc or clear alloc, uh, which is just another C function. Usage is identical but it will do the clearing. Now, historically, people would use calloc very sparingly, um, or not at all, because why bother clearing your memory if you're just going to overwrite it yourself? But in the case of a try and in a CS50 spell checker, if you're planning to clear that memory anyway, as with a for loop or a while loop, then yeah, let calloc do it for you, because it probably is using a for loop or a while loop itself to do that. I was just reading an article recently about calloc and how it was not really used historically, too. 
you? No, because, I mean, performance. Like, literally, by calling Calloc, you are asking the computer to do, let's say, twice as much work. Give me memory. Oh, and by the way, clear it for me. I mean, clear your own memory. It's kind of the mindset. And only initialize it when you absolutely have to. And that would have been O of N, too, right? Because it doesn't have to go over every single byte in that set. And set yeah, most serve. likely, unless there's some hardware optimizations where you can actually clear a whole page of memory sure, efficiently. Yeah. But I guess that'd be up to beyond my, my familiarity. Sure. Yeah. All right. So where did we leave off? We had just benchmarked, if you will, the running time of the load function uh, by computing after and before. So if we actually want to compute the total time involved in loading, let's go ahead and call that time underscore load and go ahead and calculate that value, which is actually pretty easily done, just to after minus before. In C, we have to do some annoying calculations because of how those structures work. Python, you just don't need to worry about that. You can just compute it with arithmetic. Do we write those functions ourselves, the calculate functions? We wrote calculate uh, ourselves. If you go to the bottom of this file, you'll see an annoying function that oh, actually right. dives okay. into the data structure being used. You just don't need to do I see. that yeah, that's, yeah. in Python uh, at all. Import so. time. Import time or anti-gravity if you prefer. <laughs> so this is going to be a heck of an implementation before long. So let's see what we're actually going to code live versus just kind of whip out a sample solution from the oven here. But let's see how this actually maps to the, the code in question. Because I think we'll probably just want to pull up a, a spoiler at some point probably, here. Probably, yeah. It's uh, close. It's a 4.06. We have on 24 minutes-ish before right. the stream officially ends. So let's see, let's see how far along we get here. Um, let's go ahead and open the actual text. So on the left-hand side here, we got some pointers involved. Thankfully, those are not going to be involved here in Python. But let me go ahead and kind of convert this as closely as I can here. Give me a variable called text on the left. Let me go ahead and go into argv2. If the length of argv equals 3, else argv1. So this is just giving me the last command line argument, which is either uh, position 2 or position 1, depending on how many total words were passed in. Then let me go ahead and check uh, open the file uh, called text in read-only mode. Um, and just for good measure, I can actually specify an encoding, though this might not strictly be necessary given what dictionary you're using. But I'm going to specify Latin 1, which is essentially ASCII, uh, as it is in our C problem set here. Um, notice I misspelled argv, so uh, the IDE is yelling at me with that little red circle. And then I'm just going to do some error checking. So if there's not actually a file, we might have screwed up or the user might have messed up. So I'm just going to go ahead and say something like print uh, could not, whoops, could not open uh, the name of that text. Let's go ahead and make this an F string or format string. Then let's go ahead and call unload, whatever it does, even though we secretly know it doesn't need to do anything in Python, and then just go ahead and exit with one. So some of these lines aren't strictly necessary. We could introduce like a context manager like you proposed before, mm -hmm. but I wanted to handle the errors exactly like we are in C, just so that you can kind of see C to Python left to right. There's one thing on line 33 that I would suggest uh -oh. for folks who might not know some of the shortcuts you can use with lists in Python. Okay. For example, we're, all we're essentially trying to do here on line 33 is just take the last, no matter what it is, we're always oh, going to take I the last you're thing, right? This. Yeah. So instead of using argv2 or you know argv1, we can just always take, without any condition, uh, argv negative 1. Ooh. And that'll just give us the last uh, element in that list. Indeed. Now this does assume that earlier in the file we have validated that this has the right number of command line arguments because it's Correct. got like 10 arguments. We don't want to take the 10th or the 9th or whatever. Uh, we want to make sure it has exactly the right number. Correct. But we did that indeed earlier already. Yeah, I like that a lot. We'll, let's keep that. All right. So after that, notice that we want to prepare to report the, the misspelled words. That's actually kind of an easy one-liner. So let's, let's give ourselves some room and scroll up here so we have a place to put this. All right, so right up here, let's go ahead and just print out uh, exactly as we did in C, just using some new lines just to format it. Nothing really interesting there. Uh, misspelled words, a couple new lines. Notice I only need one new line, though, because we get one for free with Python, because the end of a line in Python is by default that. But if we know that, we can just leverage that assumption. Now let's go ahead and prepare to spell check the word. And I'm going to go ahead and give myself an empty word, which is the equivalent of this line over here. And see, you have to know how many characters you're going to fit. It turns out from the problem statement, if you read into CS50's homework, uh, you'd see that the maximum length of any word is going to be length. Uh, which is a constant, which is like 45 or so characters defined elsewhere. But we don't care in Python because the words can grow and shrink. Then I'm going to go ahead and initialize, whoops. Then I'm going to go ahead and initialize some variables on the Python side uh, to be like an index uh, of misspellings uh, and words, all equaling 0, 0, and 0 using this fancy tuple approach as before. 
All right, very welcome, Trepanator. All right, so now let's go ahead and spell check every word in the file. This is painful in Python uh, in C because you have to take baby steps in reading the input. The problem in C is that you can't really safely read in from an arbitrary text file an arbitrary number of bytes. Like you have to decide in advance how many bytes maximally you're going to read. The problem though is if we're reading words from a file. I don't know how long or how short my lines are going to be. It could be infinitely long or however much memory I actually have on disk. And so here the best way in C is to take baby steps. Read one little character at a time and just accumulate those characters rather than blindly read as many as you can. Python, I don't have to worry about any of that. I'm just going to go ahead and do the following in an infinite loop while true as follows. If I want to read a, a character from the file, let me go ahead and just say, whoops, that's not how you spell true in Python. Let me just go ahead and say file.read one character here. If there's not a character, then I'm going to go ahead and break out of this. That means I'm at the end of the file. But if I actually want to now assemble words from the file, and this is what's tricky here. Unlike the dictionary where I can just read one, one word at a time from a line, the file we're spell checking might have sentences and paragraphs. They might have apostrophes and punctuation and all this nastiness. So we need to actually distinguish. So I'll do this one a little quickly, essentially porting our C from the left to our Python code here at the right. But among the approaches I could take here is this. If re match this regular expression a uh, dash z little a dash little z C, or it is the case that C equals an apostrophe and I have already read in part of a word implying that this variable called index from our C version is greater than zero, then I can go ahead and append this current character uh, to I append this current character to the word and I'm going to go ahead and increment my index counter advancing in the word. So what am I doing here? I'm taking tip uh, tiptoeing through the file that we're spell checking, taking one character at a time. So if the name the word in the file is Colton, I'm getting a C. O L T O N. Yay, rah, rah. So we're reading in Colton and one character at a time and then just appending it to a variable called word, incrementally building up your name. An yeah. index you're using to, to just keep track of the fact that you're inside a word, right? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Now, if meanwhile I've read too many uh, lines, I might actually say this. So if the index is actually now longer than the maximum length of a word that's allowed, I'm actually going to go ahead and consume the rest of the string and just throw this away because it's not supported. Something is wrong. So while true, I'm going to go ahead and read in one more character. And if it is not a character or it is not the case that that character matches the following regular expression or pattern as it really is, A through capital Z or little a through lowercase z, then what I'm going to go ahead and do is just break out of this altogether. Essentially something has gone wrong. Okay. Then once that, uh, if nothing has gone wrong, I'm going to go ahead and reset index and word to zero in the empty string just with a little one liner there, but I could write that syntactically a little different and actually proceed as follows. So I don't like how the IDE is yelling at me in so many different places here. Let's see, undefined variable RE. Oh, we solved that problem before. We did. So that's RE, regular expression, refers to pattern matching capabilities of a library. So you know what? Let's try that trick before. Import RE, scroll back down. Uh, come on, magic, nice. We've whittled this down further. How about here, undefined variable length. Ah, so I cut some corners here and I didn't actually define the length of the longest word. Should have done that way early on. Looks like I skipped a step. Uh, length equals 45. I think I just said that one verbally. Cool. All right, so let's go back down here. Voila, all my code looks correct, of course. And now let's go ahead and check a couple other things. So this line up here was saying if each of the characters we're reading one at a time out of the file is alphabetical, A through Z, uppercase or lowercase, or it is an apostrophe like Colton's, the possessive, then we're going to go ahead and accumulate it. But if we run into other things, we want to handle that, those differently. So else if it is the case that C is a digit, this is a method built into uh, strings, then I'm going to go ahead and just consume these. Like let's just get rid of them because they're not part of the file I want to read. So while true, let's go ahead and read uh, one more character with file-read1. Then let me go ahead and say, well, if that's not actually a character, or it's not an alphabetical character and it's not a digit, then let me go ahead and do this with it. Whoops, all in one line here. Let's go ahead and just break out. 
And then let's go ahead and reset ourselves. Index word gets zero here. So we're going kind of quickly through the Python version. But again, the goal here is to convert the C code on the left to the Python code on the right. So just to fast forward to where we are in the story, we've just implemented on the left this C code with is digit with the equivalent Python code on the right. So is, is this all uh, distro code that they usually get, or is this the solution that we're looking this at? This is all distribution code. So everything oh, okay. on the left, students were given. They didn't oh, have to right. come up with this all Because they just had to implement own. the dictionary files, or dictionary functions, rather. Indeed, got indeed. It. Okay. So I think, why don't we go ahead and... Oh, sorry, we got a question we from We got a Andre. decent amount left. Yeah, let's take this question from Andre, of course. Can I just ask, line 76 in C, let's take a look at line 76, is a for loop that sometimes causes some confusion. Is this something you would typically use, or is it there just for pedagogical purposes to show that you aren't strictly limited to simple incrementation within a for loop? It's a good question. Um, and Andre, I do think you make a, a valid point. In CS50, we tend not to show for loops involving non-numeric initialization and updates in for loops. We pretty much always use i and j and k and so forth. Um, I would say we're using this because it is the clearest design. A for loop does exactly this. Initialize it to some value, check a condition, and then just iteratively do something again and again and again. And as such, that is the right looping construct. You could use a while loop and kind of uh, build it that way, but this is what a for loop is good at. So if anything, it's my fault or the course's fault that we don't show students different paradigms of for loops, but all the better if they get to see it here in the distribution code. Yeah, I think if you, if you have a discrete way of knowing what the end uh, result of your loop is without having some non-deterministic thing happening in a loop which is normally infinite. Um, I think that's a great reason to use a for loop at all costs. I agree. I think it's easier to read. But if you want us to sound smarter, then yeah, absolutely. This is a pedagogical decision. <laughs> uh, it's informed by years of experience. And we really just wanted students to glean some additional insight from uh, our distribution. Code. I think it is illustrative of that paradigm, though. I think it's a good point. I know. That's yeah. fair. But I think we should just fess up. That, well, <laughs> we just did it that way. It just happened to be what yeah. we felt was the best, yeah. Indeed. And uh, amazingly, we've been talking so long that Trevenator has implemented load in C. So congratulations. <laughs> oh. That's some really good nice. progress. I suppose it kind of helps that we're showing the logic in Python. But that's fine. Zamila's walkthrough similarly walks students through the process of thinking about how you load. But nicely done. Trebinator. Yeah, I think somebody taking some Python code and implementing in C is much more uh, impressive than the opposite. So. <laughs> yes, so for all those of you who have just done the opposite, <laughs> C to Python, Colton is not <laughs> impressed. <laughs> Um, just kidding, just kidding. So why don't we go ahead and just finish up this last for loop. And then I think I'll probably pull out some of the actual solution code because it's going to get tedious to type out some of the last stuff, the printing stuff. Sure. Um, so here we just claim if at this point in our code we have found a whole word, then we can go ahead and do the following. So um, L if index is greater than 0, thereby implying that we've accumulated at least one character. Uh, let's go ahead and increase our counter of words, which is a variable we initialized way up above to 0. Uh, then let's do some timing. So the time before we're about to do this benchmark, we'll call before again. And let's just call time process time with no arguments. Then let's go ahead and get the return value of um, check a word thereby checking if it's misspelled or not. And then let's get the time after, time.process time. And this is actually kind of cool. Uh, notice here that we did this one liner. So we want a variable called misspelled to be true if the word is misspelled and false otherwise. The catch is that check returns true if a word has checked out and it's not misspelled. But that's OK. And see, you can invert true and false, or false and true with a bang or an exclamation point. In Python, you don't do that. You actually literally say not. And that reverses the logical effect from true to false or false to true. And a lot of people will read the line on the left as not check word either way. Yeah, they'll still say not, even though in Python you literally have to write not. we got a few. It looks like uh, Trebinator says. Hey, just, we rock. Nice. Uh, sorry, or maybe that's for Trebinator. Good job. <laughs> I missed initializing my uh, letter array with no. Oh, I don't think it's Trebinator then. <laughs> that's OK. That's OK. You caught it pretty fast. Uh, we'll be posted on Facebook. We'll take a look. This is our first one. We're going to do some post-processing. And uh, just ping us on email or on Facebook to ask after this, if you don't mind. Cool. I think it's uh, at least be on YouTube. Yeah. 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 All right. So let's uh, finish this up. So I've just done a benchmark here with checking for misspelled. Uh, let me just do some total time checking here. So time check is going to now equal the uh, difference between after minus before. 
That's the total amount of time. And we're doing this in our loop, which is why I'm now accumulating. We want to do this for every word, see how much time we've totally spent. And now here, if a word was misspelled, let's go ahead and print that word, which is required by the problem specification in the homework assignment itself. And then let's just increment misspellings by one to keep track of how many words are misspelled. Um, and then let's get started to do another loop. Index and word should be reset to zero and quote unquote. Could do this in different ways, but I just adopted that little tuple approach. And then assuming all of this went super well, let's just close that file. And as before, we could use um, Context Manager and let that happen for us, but we're trying to do a one-to-one -one mapping with the C code. And indeed, if I scroll down here, you'll see a called fclose, which is also checking. There's some f error code, which isn't necessary in Python, which is checking if there was an error, what went wrong. We would ideally do these in Python using exceptions anyway. Um, you know what? We are almost at the bottom of the file. Let's just take it home. I think, yeah? we, should, I think we should do it. Let's make ourselves a spell checker here. Scotty says complete. you guys are awesome. Thanks, Scotty. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Don't say that until we get to the end here. <laughs> now let's go ahead and count how, many, uh, how long it takes to compute the dictionary size, even though it's probably pretty fast since we're just taking, um, checking a variable's value. Uh, n shall be the size, the result of calling our size function. And then after, of course, becomes time uh, dot process time. Uh, then here, let's just store in our variable. Whoops. Let's just store in our variable uh, time underscore size, which we initialized earlier to zero, uh, which strictly speaking wasn't necessary. We were just doing that for parity with the C version. Uh, now let's go ahead and time the unload function, which should really be fast. Process time. Whoops. Uh, process time. As an aside, is there for the for the P set? Is there a sort of minimum or I guess maximum time that the students are given for their uh, solution to work? Not really. I mean, they're given a week to implement it, but the code itself can run as long as they'd like. Realistically, if they run it through Check50, our auto grading infrastructure probably gets stopped automatically after like 30 seconds. Okay. But um, even with the slowest of data structures, like an array, uh, that should be plenty of time, even to spell check some of those larger files. We're really talking milliseconds, not so much seconds or minutes. Okay. Um, all right, after we've done this, let's just do an after benchmark, uh, calling time process time again. And then let's go ahead and check, whoops, no parentheses there. Uh, if not unloaded, let's go ahead and yell uh, as much to the user. Uh, could not load our dictionary, just I as would, in C. I would, 104 has got a very subtle bug. If not unload, oh, you are right. I was accidentally checking a function value. That was not gonna work, nice catch. Let's go ahead and exit with one there. And let's scroll up. And I honestly don't really want to type out all these prints in Python. This oh, is man. very ugly looking. So just like Julia Child, uh, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and go into our Python version here, which is in our speller.py uh, speller file. And voila, let's move it over to the right-hand side. Voila. Oh, magic. <laughs> Look at that. I suppose it's mostly copy-paste, although the format strings change and so forth. So if you're not familiar, let's point out a couple of things here. One, we're using print instead of printf. Two, we are using uh, f strings or format strings to plug those things in there. And three, we're using these format codes with f strings where you specify the variable name that you want to print, uh, colon, and then dot some number, which is the number of decimal points you want to place, uh, print two in this case, and then F for floating point value. And then the nicest line of all is this exit <laughs> success. Um, we don't need to do sys since I didn't import sys in that way. You can just use exit in this case, but sys would be a um, more proper version, I'd say. For folks who might have familiarity with older Python, but not 3.6 and over, the F string is a new feature. So that's it something is. That you need this in Python 3.6. Previously, you used uh, percentage signs and the, format dot, so the string dot format function. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was a lot uglier, but now you can just preface a string with F and then include the sort of bracket um, variables in there with the format specifiers and it'll just work. Indeed. And uh, Scotty529 asks, are there any more in-person visits to Harvard available? Indeed. Let me see if I can remember the URL offhand. I think it's CS50 Lectures 2018. No. Uh -oh. CS50 Lectures. There, there it goes. Go. Is this, wait, is this the right year? Let's just check. 2018, yeah, so if you go to, let me enhance, uh, picatick.com, 
slash cs50-lectures, you will see a landing page where you can uh, sign up for free tickets to any of CS50's lectures that remain this fall. We only have a few left. Uh, if this is of interest to you and you can travel to Cambridge or you'll be in the Boston area and want to drop by, they're all on Friday mornings. Uh, thereafter, you can go to uh, go on a, a free tour of the campus with some of our undergraduate friends who are kindly offering those right after lecture itself and then see a bit of the university too. Nice. Yeah. Any, uh, any other questions from folks here tuned in? Oh, we didn't run it. We gotta, we gotta run it, right? Are we gonna run? Oh, this you want to see that my code actually works? Yeah. We gotta... Oh, I missed. Did we miss that question? No. 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 Okay. Now you're really putting me on the spot. Now we have to trust that the code actually works. So yeah, let's go ahead and open up a terminal window here. Uh, let me go into, if you will, just the pre-baked version, just in case I did anything stupid here, and go into Speller. Uh, in this directory, notice I've got speller.py and dictionary.py from before. In dictionaries, recall that we have large and small. We'll use the big one. And if I do ls on text, we see a whole bunch of sample text. Let's say Shakespeare, uh, which is a pretty big file. In fact, if you want to look at Shakespeare, uh, this, oops, in the text directory, uh, this will actually be a pretty big file, as indicated by the progress bar there. Come on, come on, come on. And you'll see the complete text? works. Oh, wow of Shakespeare. So mind you, there's going to be a lot of misspelled words that are really just old English, but that's fine because we are spell checking against something. So let's go ahead and run this. Let me go ahead and run Python or Python 3 to be specific on, uh, let's say, the large dictionaries. So we'll go into dictionaries, large, and then we'll run this on, uh, let's do this on texts and Shakespeare. Something went wrong. Oh, yeah, wait, wait. Wait, what am I doing? Oh, did I? Hmm, hmm. Oh, oh, I'm wait. not running. I'm <laughs> trying to interpret. And we're trying to interpret the dictionary file, right? Yes, key step, <laughs> key step. OK, so let's actually run speller.py. OK, that was going to be the worst ending to any stream here. And now let's do this on large. Woo, OK, aardvarks is not a Python command. No, no. Here we go. All right, here we go. We're spell checking all these words coming out, recall, are the result of that print statement. Um, because I have a pretty tall screen right now and because this is a web-based IDE, uh, my spell checker seems to be god awful, but that's just an internet latency thing. Uh, it's just taking some time for all the print statements to get spit out. And indeed, if you actually compute the total CPU time running that spell checker on the complete works of Shakespeare, only took 1.7 seconds. The number of words that were misspelled was 45,000 or more. The number of words in that dictionary is indeed just over 140,000. The number of words in Shakespeare is very talkative, 904,000 plus words. And you can see a breakdown of the number of milliseconds we spent uh, in each of those functions, checking, taking the most and time. And those print statements, those are all the misspelled words, correct? All the misspelled words okay. were got, what got spit out. And so if we actually hid that uh, print statement, we would actually see these results much more quickly. It's just because of the internet speed and the printing thereof that creates the uh, illusion that the spell checker is slower than it is. But those running times are the result of time.process time, which is indeed an accurate count. Based on the words that I saw coming up on the terminal, it looked like it was all pretty correct to me. So. I think that's a correct, but that's proof by correctness. <laughs> um, uh, Scotty says, do you guys play video games? What's your favorite game right now? Do any help you be a better programmer? I'll let you answer first and then I'll follow up. I don't really anymore. I think the last video game I played was with Colton. We played uh, the new newish Zelda. Breath of the Wild. Yeah, Breath of the Wild on the Nintendo office. Switch. But I realized that if I only allow my, we played until I essentially needed to fall asleep, at which point we just, I decided, okay, that's it for Switch, the Wii, Nintendo for the year. I'm pretty sure you fell asleep too. Did I fall? Okay, so yes. But it was fun. I think it was after last year's CS50 fair. We decided, no, we're going to get through the school year. Then we're going to play a few hours of Switch. Was it after the hackathon? Or I think No, it would have been after the hackathon. Maybe it was after the fair. I think yeah. it was after CS50 was all done. I yeah, this is like a year ago now. Uh, two years ago, it was 2016. Well, we didn't even play anything after last or, year's CS50 wait, no, fair. No, 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 you're right. It was it was like during J term of 2017. All right, so the point is no <laughs> is really weird. I, when I was a kid, I used to play Commodore 64, Macintosh games. We weren't allowed to have a Nintendo, but I used to play on my best friend's Nintendo when he let me borrow it. So that's rough. Yeah. So no, uh, did any of that help me be a better programmer? Yes, you can, yes. Uh, CS50 at Harvard says that playing video games makes you a better programmer. Honestly, no, not in my case. I don't think I played enough or thought about it to any kind of sophisticated level where that's an issue, but Colton, maybe? Certainly games back then were less flexible in that area. Uh, Scotty mentions, I heard you can program in Minecraft. That's absolutely true. Mm. Um, yeah. There are certain mods 
in Minecraft. Uh, one of them is called Computercraft, which actually lets you program in Lua, um, which is pretty cool. You can actually program the game blocks in the world in Lua in real time. Um, it was called Computercraft. I'm not sure if it's been redone recently. This was several years ago. Um, but there's games like Shenzhen.io, uh, which is a hacking game, and TIS 800, I believe, are also another programming game. Very, um, very sort of, well, not realistic, but kind of realistic. Uh, it requires the same logic. Um, and I, I would say if you're looking for games that can help you program, definitely check those out. Uh, and as for what I'm playing right now, I'm playing Fallout New Vegas, which is not helpful for programming okay. at all. And uh, Colton, Colton's being modest here. He's not plugged uh, a course he teaches here at Harvard's Extension School that's now freely available on edX. If you go to cs50.edx.org slash games, that'll whisk you away to this website here, which you where you can register for free. Uh, they want to know our location for some reason. <laughs> but you can enroll now for free by clicking the audit option, and this will actually introduce you to Lua, the programming language, uh, Love2D, which is a gaming library framework that you can use to make your own games, and it actually then, uh, yes, claim it is homework to be playing games. True, yeah. Yeah, um, and I think going forward too, I would definitely like to start streaming games made using these same technologies. So if any of those appeal to you, definitely check the course out. And a question here, uh, guys, I'm planning to enroll in a computer science degree, but it will be after a year from now. I finished CS50. What course do you recommend me uh, to study during my uh, preparing to the CS degree? Um, totally depends. I mean, I would typic a typical undergrad here at Harvard, for instance, would generally take another software class, specifically a class in functional programming or object-oriented programming. And I think that's for those uh, folks interested in software especially and introductory computer science. It's a nice way to kind of counterbalance the very procedural programming that we do in a class like CS50 and a lot of courses also do albeit some courses do focus on object-oriented stuff. Um, but I also recommend a course by some of our friends at Princeton. There's a free introduction to algorithms class that's on Coursera. If I do a quick Google here, uh, Coursera with Kevin Wayne and his colleague uh, on algorithms at Princeton, uh, this should be freely available, part one and part two. Uh, you should be able to sign up with Bob and with Kevin here on Coursera.org, also for free. And this is a more theoretically oriented class, uh, but that also gives you another perspective as to what CS is and should definitely challenge you in a different way. Do you know Robert by, by chance? A little met bit. Him? We've met once or twice, but oh. I know Kevin much better from past conferences. Interesting. I know. I happen to know his, I've seen his books, so Robert's book. Yeah, the two of them now actually write um, quite a bit, I think, together as well. Nice. Um, and I think uh, Trebinator mentioned you can program mods for it. I think you have to use Java. That is correct. Yes, for Minecraft. Yeah. So please feel free to uh, join us here again online. We're going to figure out what the next day and time is. We'll publicize it on the, um, on, uh, the Facebook channel, Twitter, uh, subreddit, and the like. Uh, we'll figure out how to get some of these assets online too if you want to follow along later today uh, or thereafter. Certainly tell your friends if you'd like to join as well. Yeah, and definitely let us know what sorts of topics you all are interested in uh, us going over and teaching. I know I'm going to be probably catered towards game programming, but I'm more than happy to do like Python and web stuff, even though web's not necessarily as much of a strong suit. And I think we're also talking to Brian about him setting mm -hmm. up uh, I think Brian is going to maybe set up a micro blog, do a live micro blog uh, implementation. Oh, does Brian know this yet? Uh, yeah, he does. Oh, he does now. He, okay. he, he didn't this morning. He, so. and, I, he and I are going to. Oh no, I, I talked to him yesterday oh, about it. Yeah. Oh, okay. He knew as of yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, nice. But yeah, that's uh, we have a bunch of ideas. But let us know what's uh, obviously most valuable to you, so we can uh, have a better idea of where to go. Yeah, I think we're pretty much at the end point here. Special thanks to Dan, who's been off camera here, helping us run the show, and all the credit for this idea goes to Colton, who spearheaded this idea with Twitch. Uh, so we're really glad you all tuned in today. Yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. It was uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, see you online soon.